What is evangelism? Evangelism is simply the preaching of the gospel or the Christian beliefs to others with the intention of conversion. Very simple what evangelism is. Reverend Billy Graham tells a, tells a story of a, a time early in his ministry when he went into a small town and he wanted to mail a letter at the post office and not knowing where it was at, he found a young boy and asked the young boy, uh, son, do you know where the post office is at? I want to mail this letter. And the boy gladly takes Mr. Graham to the closest post office and shows him where it's at so that, that uh, Billy Graham can mail this letter out. And Billy, being grateful, says, uh, says boy, now if you want to go to the Baptist church this evening, you can hear me tell everyone how to get to heaven. And the boy says, uh, I don't think I'll be there, Mr. Graham. And Billy looks at him and says, well, why not? And the boy says, because you don't even know how to get to the post office. <laughs> Evangelism. It'll take a while, it'll sit in. Evangelism, what is evangelism? I'm going to tell someone about the things of Christ or biblical truths with the hope that they will accept the Lord as their God and as their Savior, evangelism. When we think of evangelism, a lot of times the first thing that we think about is uh, large crusades or men like Billy Graham and D.L. Moody or George Whitfield. You may have heard of um, Charles Spurgeon or John Wesley, a lot of these men that God used uh, over the last couple centuries as evangelists in this country and, and over in Europe and other areas to spread the gospel. And, and many, many came to know the Lord through these men. But there are a few accounts of what we think of as modern day evangelism in the Bible, meaning uh, very large groups coming to know the Lord or very large events where an evangelist is actually standing uh, there in the midst of the crowd and preaching the gospel. One of these times is found in Acts chapter 2 though, and let me set up Acts chapter 2 for you. Uh, Jesus in Acts chapter 1 just ascended to heaven And right before he went to heaven, he gives his disciples one last encouragement there in chapter 1, verse 8. It says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be a witness to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So Jesus has one last chance to encourage his disciples with something That one last moment, and I wonder if he pondered, what am I going to leave these guys with? And he leaves them with this. The Holy Spirit will be your strength, and you will be a witness, or you will share the gospel. He says, in your homes, Jerusalem. He says, to your neighbors, Judea. And he says, even to your enemies, they're in Samaria or the Samaritans. The Samaritans were captives that the king of Assyria had brought into the area of Samaria, uh, uh, north of Jerusalem. And because they weren't full Jewish, but because they intermarried with uh, the Jews there, the Jews looked down on them and, uh, and they became somewhat of enemies there to the Jewish people, uh, even though they practiced a lot of the same rituals Uh, as the Jewish people there. And yet Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and will allow you to even love those in Samaria, to love them so much that you will be willing to go to them and to share your eternal salvation with them, to evangelize to them. And in order to have a healthy church, we have to ask the question, do we have a burden to share Jesus in our homes? in our homes? Do we have a burden to share Jesus with our neighbors? And do we even have a burden to share Jesus with our enemies? It starts with our families, doesn't it? A lot of times when somebody comes to know the Lord, what happens? Typically, they're so on fire for the Lord that it ends up spreading like wildfire to their family members, to their spouses, or to their children, moving on to the neighbors and eventually, hopefully, the Lord giving you a heart even for your enemies and that heart of forgiveness, which is 
uh, a very neat thing and only truly comes through the Lord. In chapter two of Acts, we see the day of Pentecost take place. And in uh, verses two and three, you can read with me in there, there in Acts chapter two, it says, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and one sat upon each of them. Excuse me. The event here in Acts chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, with Peter and the apostles being filled with the Holy Spirit eventually leads, as we're going to get into the rest of chapter 2, to the opportunity for Peter to stand, raise his voice, and to preach the gospel, which is a really neat and awesome opportunity, as we're going to see here. From verses 14 until the end of the chapter, we see Peter systematically laying out the gospel message to the Jews that were accusing Peter and the disciples of being drunkards, of having too much wine there at uh, uh, nine o'clock there in the morning. Let's read from verse 14 to verse 21 there in Acts chapter two. It says, but Peter, standing up with the 11, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I pour out, <clears throat> that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men will, she, will see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Verse 20, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that, whatever, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter first starts with the situation at hand. The men thought that the disciples were drunk, accusing them of finding some pretty good wine there. And Peter says that it's only the third hour of the day or nine o'clock in the morning. And he says that these men are not drunk, that it's too early. And then Peter falls back on what he knows best. And what Peter knows best is the scripture. And it's really neat to see Peter here as he shares in Acts chapter two, the amount of knowledge that he has in the scripture, the amount of confidence that he has in the scripture, the ability that he has to go back and share by memory the scriptures that he remembered, even quoting scriptures that Jesus used as Jesus spoke to the Pharisees and to uh, the religious rulers there. Peter very well could have started and finished with, we are not drunk, and he could have left it at that, defending himself and stopping there. How many times do we as believers uh, have that situation that comes up that we have to defend ourselves if we're questioned over our lifestyle or over something that we have going on uh, that pertains to our Christianity? And yet so many times we stop with the defending of ourselves, not truly getting in or taking that opportunity to share Jesus not truly taking that opportunity to share the gospel. We do it all the time. And we come up with every excuse, right? Ah, oh, they don't really want to know why. They've heard it before. They probably have their own beliefs already, you know? I don't have the time. We come up with every reason to stop short and not to share our Christian beliefs with others. But Peter here, I believe because of the encouragement that he had from Christ there in Acts chapter 1, and the power that was given him to him through the Holy Spirit there at the beginning of Acts chapter 2, he had his mind set and focused on the very first opportunity that would come his way to share his salvation. He had his mind set. He was ready. Lord, give me the opportunity to share the gospel. 
Lord, you want me to be an example in Judea and Samaria and my own hometown in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit falls upon Peter and Peter decides that he is gonna take this opportunity and share the gospel. He is focused. He is focused on evangelism. Peter decides to go all the way back to the book of Joel, speaking of the Spirit of God falling on all flesh, speaking about prophecies and speaking about visions and dreams. He speaks about spiritual things with these men. He starts in the natural. We are not drunk. He takes care of the situation at hand. And then he jumps right in to the spiritual, not wasting any time. We need to continually be praying that God would set our minds on evangelism. That God would set our minds on that opportunity that would come up for us to share the gospel. We need to be praying as we go out into the world, as we hang out with our friends, as we go out to our jobs, as we run into even our enemies. Lord, give me the opportunity. Lord, give me the strength to share my relationship with the hope that they will come to know you that the Lord would anoint us even with his Holy Spirit and give us that mind, always looking for the opportunity to run from the natural to the spiritual in our conversations, to take that time, to take the time, that opportunity to just share Jesus. Listen uh, to what Peter says next there in verses 22 and 24. Read with me. It says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested or proven by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Peter wastes no Time. Peter jumps right into the gospel message here. He stands up, it says that he raises his voice and he boldly tells the men the truth. Truth. What an interesting concept, truth. How simple that concept of truth. Jesus, pro- proven by God, proven by the miracles, by the signs that he did here on earth crucified on the cross by men and yet appointed by God for this to happen. And yet God raised him up from the dead, conquered death, not being able to hold him down. He loosed the pains of death, it says, the hope that Peter shares with them. What a simple concept. Who is this guy, Peter? Peter, wow, what a word, what a message that you have for these men. What boldness that you have, Peter. Who is this guy, Peter? Is this the same Peter that stuck his foot in his mouth so many times before? As we read through the Gospels, is this the same Peter that that thought that he could get out of the boat and walk on water with Jesus? And as he started to walk on the water with Jesus, he looked off and he got frightened and started to sink into the ocean. And Jesus responded, oh, you of little faith. Why do you doubt, Peter? Is this the same Peter that in Matthew chapter 16 tried rebuking Jesus about going to the cross? And Jesus responded, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Is this the same Peter that said, even if I'll leave you, Lord, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And then turned his back on Jesus and even denied Jesus to even a lowly servant girl. And he says that he started to curse and swear when they started to ask Peter if they knew him. Is this the same Peter? I would say no. I would say no, this isn't the same Peter. This is a whole new Peter. This is a completely different Peter. We can see the difference Plain as day between this Peter and, and uh, between that Peter and this Peter. And let's not give Peter the glory for this. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we know we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. The NIV says it this way. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. So Peter here isn't the same Peter. We no longer see Peter for who he once was. We no longer see Peter for all the mistakes that he made, for the, for the flesh that he, the weakness in the flesh that he had. But now we see Peter according to who he is in Christ. And it says that we even let once looked upon Jesus as just a man, but we no longer do because we know who Jesus Christ really is. And it says that now we see Peter as he is in Christ. And so we see one another in the same manner. We see one another in the same strength. As I look out, I have to see you guys in Christ and in the strength that Jesus Christ gives you. The timid has now become bold. What a neat thing. The thief has now become the giver. The wicked has now become the righteous. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This isn't the same Peter. This is a brand new Peter. This is a brand new creation according to 2 Corinthians there. This Peter has the power from the Holy Spirit to speak words boldly to raise his voice in the midst of large crowds and to be confident in the word of God. Peter has a heart of love for the people. Healthy evangelism can only come from healthy creations. In the same way, you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. When Jesus looks at you, he doesn't see you any longer in the, in the sin and in the flesh that he once saw us in or that we once were in, but he now sees us again being confident and being able and being strong in his word. A healthy church has healthy evangelism. Healthy Christians are healthy evangelists. We're not all called to be evangelists, but we're all called to do the work of an evangelist. Remember, this might not be your calling uh, uh, in your ministry, or this might not be your specific ministry, as we went over last week, that not all are called to participate or to lead worship. Not all are called to lead discipleship. Not all are called to be evangelists, but all are called to have some degree of evangelism in their life. All are called to do the work of, of an evangelist. Let's read verse 36 through 39. There in Acts. 36 says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off as many as the Lord our God will call. Peter could have stopped at simply defending himself when it came to him and these Jewish uh, religious leaders. He could have even rebuked them through scripture. He could have proven his point through the word of God, but the power of his message would have been lost. He would have stopped there. These Jews never would have come to know the Lord, at least not here in this, at this time, in this way. All the power behind Peter's message would have completely been lost if Peter never would have shared the gospel with these men. Romans 10, 14 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom they have not heard? 
And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? We need preachers. We need evangelists. We don't need preachers or evangelists that are on payroll. We don't need men and women that are willing to preach the word of God or to share the gospel because they get paid for it. But we need men and women that simply just love sharing the gospel and their faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, give me the strength to share your gospel at my job, in the midst of my career. Help me, Lord, to be strong, to be confident in your word. Help me to know your scriptures. You may have stuck your foot in your mouth so many times, right? Foot and mouth disease, as Peter once had. But God has given you a helper, he says there in Acts chapter 2. He's given you the Holy Spirit to fill you with his power in order to fulfill evangelism, in order to fulfill the ability of sharing the gospel. Evangelism is not Billy Graham. Evangelism is not Greg Laurie. Evangelism is not Peter. More often than not, we see one-on-one evangelism in the Bible. And most of you were probably uh, brought here or brought to the Lord originally from one-on-one evangelism, probably from somebody taking the time to share Jesus and to share their relationship with God with you. That evangelism, simply preaching the gospel uh, or the Christian beliefs to others with the intention of conversion. Do we have that intention of conversion when we speak to others? We need to get back to Jesus, you guys. We need to get back to just simply sharing the gospel. Too many times do I invite someone to church. Too many times do I invite someone to an event. I need to invite someone to the Lord. I need to invite someone to know Jesus and just simply share my relationship with the Lord with them. Second Timothy chapter four, verse one through five says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, Paul tells Timothy. We are the church. We are the evangelists. We are the vehicle that the Lord has chosen to share the good news, to share about his return. How neat that is that he has chosen us. He could have chosen anything else. He could have chosen angels. He could have chosen rocks, but he chose us Christians to be that vehicle to share the gospel. Revelations 20, 11, verse 15 through 15 says, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God and, and books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead whom were in it and death and Hades delivered up the dead whom were in them and they were judged each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Take hell out of the equation and evangelism makes no sense. Leave hell out. Leave the truth out behind the punishment of sin, behind that eternal separation from God and there is no reason for evangelism. But leave it in and it becomes a dire need 
It becomes so important. I want to read an article, if I can, with you guys real quick from a, a, a church. It's called Calvary Church. I don't believe it's a Calvary Chapel, but uh, the article here from the pastor, he says, I stood alone scanning the parking lot of my new church. It was three minutes before Sunday school and not a single car containing visitors had turned down the gravel lane. I thought of Zechariah 4.10 where God asked, who despises the day of small things? At that moment, I despised the day of small things. My new post had a 35-year history and 33 people. Morale was low. Our building was secluded on the back of the property. Everything from the burnt orange carpet to the peeling vinyl entryway to the crooked sign said, stay away. Worship was stifled and awkward. It didn't, I didn't have a novel strategy to help the church grow. Evangelism programs I knew didn't seem to fit this congregation. And I was, I was too inexperienced to make an appropriate modification. On that second week in September, I didn't want to stay at Calvary Church anymore. I wanted to eat a Sunday brunch and start packing. I might have, except for the tan Chevy I saw, turned down the lane. I smiled, waved, and slipped inside. As I remember, we had a banner day that Sunday, and the rule was, if it breathes, count it. I think that might be the same rule we have here. That day we counted 39 people. People seemed pleased with the turnout. That was 15 years ago. Today, Calvary Church is a healthy and vibrant, is healthy and vibrant. Some transfer growth helped us along the way, though I have learned that people who drift in from other churches usually drift out in short order. A wise elder defined these short-termers as scaffolding. They help you build for a while, and then they fold up and move on. We experienced good growth as people moved into the community and became part of the church. But by far, the most solid growth came through personal evangelism. And the growth of the new birth uh, and, and the joy of the new birth radiating from new believers. Having built a foundation through prayer, we affirmed that it is God's will that every church grow. The early church was our example. It became, we became convinced uh, that any healthy body will grow, but it will require time and nourishment. If a church does not experience growth, it has a fundamental problem. No church can move forward without two convictions, that God wants the church to grow and that people in the church want it to grow. At Calvary Church, we endeavor to create a healthy discontent with, a, with the status quo. People soon understood that a static church is a struggling church, and God delights in partnering us to solve the problem. With these principles, we simplified and personalized evangelism. We weren't anywhere near the commitment level needed to support some of the uh, evangelism programs. I wanted to implement some of the evangelism pro- programs I wanted to implement. So our focus became people rather than programs. We determined that evangelism comes down to one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. The greatest tool for evangelism are not located in a binder and tape series. They are sitting in our pews every Sunday morning. Since 86% of people who come to Christ are won through the witness of a friend, relative, associate, or neighbor, no church can complain about a lack of resources for evangelism. Every Sunday, I'm looking at, I'm looking at and preaching to, our, to my evangelism program. Uh, several women came without their husbands. Their fervent prayer challenged us to join in the battle for these men's salvation. One by one, we saw these husbands give their lives to Christ. Today, some of these men lead ministries in our church. Most churches would grow by 50% if we would reach the immediate families, uh, the immediate families of our members. I have found that more prayer and less push opens the door of a stubborn heart. One woman drove by our church every morning for six years, and from time to time, she thought about visiting. One day, 
She sat next to a businessman on an airline flying back to Greensboro. The subject of church came up in their conversation and the businessman invited her to church. She visited and her life was transformed. She lived a few blocks away, but she found us at 33,000 feet because one beggar told another beggar where to get bread. How neat. And I love that article, not because of the growth and all that. That is just a, a, an outcome of the, evang- of the evangelism, because, but because of the focus that we are the evangelists that we are the, evangel- the evangelized team or the evangelism ministry at the church. As we have healthy growth, or as we have healthy evangelism, it will no doubt lead to healthy fellowship. There was a new family that moved into town and their son came to Sunday school and he seemed very upset as he f- sat with the teacher and the teacher asked him, asked him, son, why are you so upset to be here at Sunday school? And the son looked at his teacher and said, because I wanted to go fishing today. My dad's going fishing. And the, and the teacher said, well, uh, the teacher said, well, son, did, the, did your dad explain to you why church is so, important, so much more important than going fishing? And the boy said, yes, he did. He said, because he didn't have enough bait for the both of us. <laughs> Healthy evangelism. I butchered it. I love how you guys still laugh, though. You guys are so supportive. <laughs> Healthy evangelism will no doubt lead to healthy fellowship. That's the next topic that we have, healthy fellowship. And it's kind of neat how the Lord set up these two topics in the series here of a healthy church because Acts chapter two leads right in to healthy fellowship. Let's read in verse 40 through 47. It says, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So you accept the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior. You're so grateful for your new salvation. A load of bricks has been lifted off of your shoulders through forgiveness, and you can't wait to be at church for every single service, right? No, not always. It's not always that easy, is it? There's a lot of questions around fellowship in the church, and even, uh, amongst believers, and more specifically, a lot of questions around simply going to church. Many Christians are confused about when to fellowship, where to fellowship, how often to fellowship, how I can fellowship, if I even need to fellowship. PewResearch.org pulled uh, pulled people around the U.S. regarding church attendance, and this is what they have to say. It says, the percentage of Americans who say that they seldom or never attend religious service, services aside from weddings and funerals, has risen modestly in the past decade. Roughly three in 10 U.S. adults, 30%, now say that they seldom or never attend a worship service from 25% in 2003. According to aggregated data from Pew Research Center surveys, they, uh, the share of people who say that they attend services at least once a week has remained relatively steady at 37% compared to 39% a decade ago. And they even say, of course, how often people say they usually attend service is not necessarily the same as how often they actually attend service. We always look, think we look better than we really do, right? Among the growing share of religiously unaffiliated adults in the U.S., the vast majority say that they are not looking for religion. And relatively few, 5%, 
say they go to services weekly or more often. Only 5% of those that are uh, unaffiliated with a church or with a religion. But what keeps people who have a religious affiliation, that is, who identify with a particular religious group out of the pews? In other words, what keeps the church out of the church? is what they're saying here. In 2012, Pew Research Poll asked respondents to answer this question in their own words. Among religiously affiliated Americans who say that religion is at least somewhat important in their lives, but who attend worship service no more than a few times a year, 24% cite personal priorities, including 16% who say that they are too busy as reasons that they do not attend more often. Another 24% mention practical difficulties, including work conflicts, health problems, or transportation difficulties. Nearly 4 in 10, 37%, point to an issue directly related to, a, to the religion or the church itself. The most common religion-related response includes disagreements with the beliefs of the religion or their church leaders or beliefs that attending worship service is not important. That's a lot of church that doesn't go to church, that doesn't believe that it is even important to go to church. A whole lot of them say that the personal priorities, being too busy and practical difficulties, keep them from attending church services. What greater priority can you have than growing your relationship with the Lord? What greater priority can you have than being taught the word of God and being in fellowship and encouraged from other believers? How can you be too busy on a Sunday morning? 168 hours a week that we have and we can't give two of them to the Lord and we're just too busy. Almost 40% blame the church itself. It says through disagreements, different beliefs and church just not being important. Lord, help us when we let disagreements get in the way of us coming to church and being encouraged through the word. I don't like the color of the tablecloths. They didn't, they didn't like my idea for that ministry that I had. I didn't like the type of coffee that they offer. We come up with every reason to get out of hearing the word of God being taught. Those disagreements that we have. I don't believe that you should drink alcohol as a believer. Well, I believe that you have that liberty. I believe once saved, always saved. I believe that, that no, you can lose your salvation. Some of the arguments that have been going around from the very beginning Yet we let these things keep us from hearing from the Lord even still. Why don't we stop trying to agree with one another and start trying to agree with the Lord? What an idea, what a concept. Getting into the word of God and see, well, I don't really agree with that. Well, let's take it to the word. Let's see what the word says. Why don't I study and research that on my own and see what the Lord speaks to me through this? Find the church that teaches the word of God book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and you'll do all right. You'll have a lot less to worry about. Can't I be a Christian from the comfort of my own home where everyone agrees with me? (laughs) I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe in the Bible. I watch sermons on TV and listen to the radio but I just don't have time for church. And honestly, I don't fit in with the people that are there. I'm too busy. I have too many priorities. And I disagree with the pastor. I don't agree with everything he says. Is it vital to have fellowship in our lives? Is it something that is necessary in a believer's life? Verses 40 and 41 it says, and with many words, or with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. First thing I want to point out here is that fellowship for Peter with these men and women started with the sharing of the gospel. 
It started even before these men were believers. Peter took the time to share the gospel with them. He took the time to fellowship with these Jewish uh, men in the midst of the chaos. Remember what was going on. Jesus Christ just crucified. Jesus Christ just ascending to heaven. The chaos that was going on in the midst of all the craziness, Peter takes the time, as it says in verse 40, to testify and to exhort them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. I'm sure Peter uh, had every excuse to stay home that day. He could have fell in very well within that 24%, saying that I don't have the time right now. I have other priorities going on right now. There's other things at hand. I'm too busy. Practical difficulties. Talk about work conflicts. One of my coworkers just turned in my boss, got him murdered. Health issues? Yeah, they're all trying to murder me and my friends. That's pretty unhealthy. Peter had every excuse, every reason to stay home that day. But it says that he took the time. I think we need to take the time, don't we? We need to take the time to build relationships, not just with other believers, not just with those that we get along with, but we need to take the time even with those that don't know the Lord, those especially that come into this place and that are curious about the Lord, that we would have that mindset again, Lord, give me the opportunity to share the gospel for the intention of conversion. Peter took the time. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So they had a problem back then even with church attendance. Paul said, don't forsake the assembly as is the manner of some. I wonder what their excuses were back then, you know? Oh, the donkey wouldn't start this morning, you know? I don't know. 24%, you know, would have rather stayed home and herded the sheep. You know, I don't know. The only way to stir up good works is through fellowship, is through the assembling. How can I encourage you if I never see you? How can I be encouraged or stirred up by you if we, if we never talk. I love how Paul says, consider one another. That word consider, consider one another. Think about one another. Think about each other. Think about stirring up the good works in each other. Think about being a witness to them. I wonder, I wonder if I could be a witness to them. I wonder if the Lord could use me to encourage that person it all begins with considering. It all begins with that thinking, that, that process, that putting it on the forefronts of our mind as Peter had done so uh, by the Lord and by the Holy Spirit here. What type of love and good works is brought out of fellowship? According to Acts chapter two, I see nine, count them with me, nine different reasons why fellowship is vital in a healthy church and in a healthy Christian's life. And they're all packed right into these seven little verses that we just read there in verse 40 through 47. Let's count them. Number one, we're encouraged or exhorted by others to believe in Jesus and to stay the course. And that is found in verse 40. It says, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Number two, we're taught doctrine or biblical truths. Number three, we get to eat. I don't hear any complaints. We get to break bread and encouraged by communion with God. Number four, we get to receive prayer and we get to pray for others, all found in verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Number five, the gifts are exercised in verse 43. Then fear came upon every soul and, every, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Number six, needs are provided for. 
verses 44 and 45. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Number seven, we get to have fun, joy, gladness. It says there in verse uh, 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Number eight, we get to praise God. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And number nine, we're right back to evangelism. The end of verse 47. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And the kingdom of God grows. That's a lot packed in the seven little verses there. Fellowship works so many things in our life that some, sometimes we don't even realize is being done. We don't even realize that the Lord is working out in us. Number one, the first thing there, we're encouraged or exhorted by others to believe in Jesus. Can I tell you that this is the whole purpose for your existence? This is the whole reason why you are still here today? Ever since the fall of man, ever since the garden, it has been us trying to get back to the Lord. And of course, it's the Lord reaching down to us and in order to build that relationship with us. But this is the whole purpose of why God has given us life that we can encourage, that we can exhort others to believe in him. Number two, we're taught doctrine or biblical truths. How can we work toward living a correct and a healthy Christian life without God's leading, without doctrine? Doctrine is simply the, the teaching of the word of God, the understanding of the biblical truths. Number three, we get to eat or break bread and we're encouraged with communion. Proverbs 10 says, the Lord will not let the righteous soul famish or go hungry. No one in the church can argue against that, right? We break bread quite often here. I don't see too many starving people here in this church. Number four, we get to receive prayer and pray for others, found in verse 42. I don't know about you, but isn't it so peaceful to receive prayer from others. That peace that you receive when you're going through something and somebody says, hey, you know what? Can I just pray for you real quick? And it just feels like, man, Lord, you're here with me. You still sit on the throne and you're in control. It is so peaceful, that prayer that we get from others. How encouraging it is. Number five, the gifts are exercised. First Corinthians uh, Chapter 12 speaks a lot about the gifts if you want to read up on them. <clears throat> because of lack of time, I won't, I won't get into that. But the gifts are exercised. Uh, uh, not all, again, have every gift. Not all have the gift of tongues. Not all have the gift of prophecy. Not all have the gift of worship. But when we get together in fellowship, don't we get to experience all the different gifts as one. It's like a team working together. It'd be like a football team without a, uh, you know, without a quarterback. Where, do we, where are we going? How, how do we win the game? We, we can't. Number six, the needs are provided for, verse 44 and 45. Matthew six thirty three says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. How many times have things gone out from this church to provide for somebody that was in need, to provide for a family. You know, we have the Love the Sheep ministry that gives out groceries every other week. How many times have God, has God provided a job through somebody at church? God provided a job for me for two years when I was in need through somebody at church. How many times has, have, you, have you gone to a party and just, you know, all the crazy amount of food that we have and we just, you just end up taking home so much for the whole week and your family is just blessed through it. Tell me that you don't get anything from fellowship and I'll tell you that you don't fellowship enough. You really don't. God will provide all your needs and it's so neat to just sit back and think of all the different ways that the Lord has provided through the church and through fellowship. Seven, we get to have fun or joy and gladness found there in verse 46. Proverbs 17, 22 says, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. It is a joy 
to be saved. I would encourage you, lighten up. Lighten up. We need to lighten up sometimes, don't we? Sometimes we take things too serious. I know I do. We need to just, just enjoy our salvation in the Lord and that fellowship that we have in him. Eight, we get to praise God there in verse 47. And last week, we went over healthy worship. Number nine, we're right back to evangelism. The end there of verse 47, it says, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And of course, John chapter three, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have ever lasting life. God doesn't just love you. God doesn't just love me or us. God loves the world, it says. God doesn't just love America. He loves the world. I was encouraged through prayer even this evening, praying for even those terrorists in Iraq and Iran and in the Middle East, that the Lord would just shower them with his love and that they would come to know him. It's a big deal. Sometimes we act like it's not a big deal. We act like our salvation is just, uh, it's just another day. It's a big deal. And through healthy fellowship and through healthy uh, evangelism, it can be a big deal to a church. It can be a big deal to us in our lives and to a community. Peter here, as he shares Jesus with the multitude, he did it with many other words, it says. Many other words. And that is what fellowship is, isn't it? With many words. And that's easier said than done. Women, you got fellowship down. You guys know how to fellowship. Guys, we got to take some lessons from the women on how to fellowship. That word fellowship, I'll leave you with this. In the, in the Greek is the word koinonia. And the word koinonia is used in a few different ways throughout the Bible. It's used here as the, as the word fellowship as we see here in Acts, 20, or Acts 2 verse 40. It's used as the word sharing or communion, a, a, a type of oneness. It's also used as the word participation or partnership koinonia in Philippians 1 verse 4 and 5 it says in all my prayers for all of you I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now all different aspects of fellowship that fellowship that oneness and that participation it's through fellowship that the believers were able to live as one church, one body, encouraging one another, and that they were able to see many added to the church, not added to the church, but many saved daily. We need to get a heart, our heart back to evangelism. We need to get our hearts back to Jesus Christ and sharing the gospel. We make it about too many other events here at the church too many times. And I love what Pastor Chuck says, Those other ministries, we need to sometimes let them die a natural death and focus on Jesus. You cannot do it on your own. It is through fellowship that you're encouraged to get into the word. It's through fellowship that you're encouraged to continue through the word of God systematically, to continue that relationship that you have with the Lord, to grow that oneness that you have with God. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you and Lord, we just thank you, God, that you have chosen us. And Lord, we're humbled that you've chosen us because there's nothing in us that says, choose me. There's nothing in us, God, that is confident. There's nothing in us that is bold. But it's only, Father, through your scriptures, it's only through your power and through your Holy Spirit, God, that we can have our hearts set on evangelism, Lord that we can have the boldness to stand, to raise our voice and to share the simple truth, Lord. God, we pray, Father, for evangelism in this church. We ask, God, that you would allow our hearts to focus on the intention of others being saved as we speak to them, Lord. That in the back of our minds, we would always be thinking, Lord, move this conversation from the natural to the spiritual. Give me that opportunity, God, to share my Christian beliefs with this person. God, we pray, Father, that we would get back to healthy fellowship, Lord. That as we meet with our brothers and sisters here at this place, God, 
that we wouldn't be like that uh, group of people that, that find no importance of coming to church or that can find every excuse and every reason not to be here. But God, we would throw all those things aside and we would say, I gotta come and hear from the Lord. I gotta come and see what the Lord is doing. And that we would get that oneness with our brothers and sisters here. Lord, forgive me for the times that I have been distant, that I haven't reached out, that I haven't prayed for my brothers or sisters here at this church. Father, we pray, God, that you would cause this place to be healthy, Lord. You would cause our hearts to be healthy, Father. Lord, we thank you, God. We love you, Father. And we thank you, God, for choosing us rather than the rocks to cry out and to worship you. And we just pray all these things in your name and your church agrees and says, amen.